the atheist novelist Marganita Lasky once, perhaps inadvertently, put her finger on the heart of the gospel, on the heart of the Christian faith. She said in an interview, what I envy most about you Christians is forgiveness. I have nobody to forgive me. And I think that's a remarkable observation. And one of the things I've learned, one of the things I've seen pastorally in my ministry is people who carry with them terrible burdens of regret, often for years to the end of their life, especially when they've done harm to people or or hurt people in their lives. And um, this message at the heart of the Christian faith, the possibility of forgiveness sets us free. It's very easy, I think, to take it for granted because we're sort of around it all the time. We talk about it all the time, but it is a profound thing of which we speak. And I think perhaps it's our hymns which speak best of it. Did you see that lovely line in the psalm? It said, you surrounded me with songs of deliverance. And I think we are surrounded by songs of deliverance. And I don't know what your favorite hymn is, but if I was to pluck a few of mine out of the air, that's exactly what they are. I think of amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Or um, uh, praise my soul, the king of heaven, ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven. Do you see there are songs that celebrate the fact that we are set free from the burdens of shame and guilt and regret that we carry. And I think they're great songs because they are each of our stories. To be Christian is not to be right or to be good, but is to be forgiven. That is our story, each of us. Is that your story? Is that your song? We need to hold on to this, you know. I think we really have a tendency to very easily slip into forgetting this and feeling guilty or regret or ashamed. And that becomes our story instead. We can be really very aware of how we have fallen short of the ways in which our lives aren't as good as they should be. But our story is not guilt or shame. It is forgiveness. It is those words at the beginning of this wonderful psalm. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. This is one of the great psalms, actually. It's not so well known as some of the others that we have looked at, but it it gets a, a massive New Testament seal of approval because Paul quotes it in Romans, right at the sort of culmination of his great treatise on justification by faith. It includes those exact words. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, and whose sins are covered. Is this your story? Is this your song? I think we probably need to face up to some of these questions. You know, this is the very hard-earned wisdom of David. And um, if you know the stories of King David, you'll know that um, he made really serious mistakes in his life. He did terrible harm to people. It was amazing because he was capable of doing such great things, but perhaps that greatness came with the flip side that he was able to do really dreadful things. And uh, he lived with the consequences of those actions. And so you hear an echo of that in verse 3. When I kept silent, he said, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. He speaks of the Lord's hand being heavy on him as in the heat of summer. We know something about that right now. Um, Guilt weighs heavily on us. Uh, Shame is a burden that we cannot shed by ourselves. And I think it's really important that we don't pretend that this doesn't matter. You know, the ways that we fall short do matter. They have consequences. When we hurt other people or our failure to love our neighbor as ourselves... That's something that we should regret. We contribute to the darkness of this world when our actions fall short of what they should be. I'm sure you know the story about um, 
uh, years ago, a newspaper ran an article sort of slightly hand-wringing, saying, what is wrong with the world? And G.K. Chesterton, the great Christian apologist, wrote in and said, sir, I am. Sincerely, G.K. Chesterton. And he's right. For whatever the big picture of what's wrong with the world, all of us have contributed to the darkness. All of us are part of the problem. All of our failures and our selfishness contributes to what's wrong with this world. And though this psalm is about serious wrongdoing, we need to all be willing to take responsibility for our part in what's wrong with the world. So it matters, and we need to not pretend that it doesn't. And we need to also kind of not go along with the way that the world tends to deal with our experience of guilt. The world tends to sort of do one of two things. One is, is denial. The argument goes like this. It says, well, listen, sure, um, you're no different to anybody else. Everybody's made mistakes. Everybody's done things wrong. So it isn't really that bad. And, uh, you know, don't, don't, don't feel responsible. You know, everybody's alike in this. It's one of those things that's sort of half true. But denial solves nothing. The other side of that is blame, to say, well, actually, you know, the reason you feel um, uh, guilty about things is because um, other people have imposed that on you, you know, maybe our parents or our school or our religious upbringing. And while we need to take that seriously, while we absolutely must reject the patterns of thought or religious practice which exploit people's guilt, and we must speak against them, but um, when that fails to understand that there seems to be something deep within us um, that needs to be dealt with, it, 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 that is not resolved by blaming other people. So this is how the wise deal with guilt. This is the wisdom of God in the Psalms. And the suggestion is that the thing that changes everything is honesty. It's a remarkable and very simple suggestion. Verse 5. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover up my iniquity. And I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. It does strike me, actually, that the, the thing which sort of exacerbates our feelings of guilt more than anything else are the fact that we think we can't speak about them. We sort of hide them and internalize them, and we live with that internal shame. And it sort of grows out of all proportion. We think, we think we're the only one in the world who struggles with these things or feels like this, and we put a, a mask on. The psalmist says, stop it. Stop pretending to be what you're not. Honesty is the thing that changes everything. Just as a slight aside, um, it's worth noting that there's two words that the psalmist uses here for, for wrongdoing. They are transgression and sin. And they, are, they have different meanings. And actually, I think that it's quite helpful to understand the difference between them. So transgression is to uh, essentially cross a line, to break a, a rule. And so you tend to know when you've transgressed because there was a rule and you did the opposite. Sin is different. Sin is the idea of falling short of a standard. So the New Testament says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the truth is that many of our actions most of the time fall short of that standard. It's a slightly more subtle thing. It's the failure to love rather than breaking a rule. Do you see the distinction? But the interesting thing is that by that standard, all of us fall short all the time. So... Honesty is the start of the process. And um, confession, coming honestly before God, is the thing that changes everything. And when we do that, the wonderful and beautiful thing, verse 5, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. It's as simple as that. We confess to God and we are forgiven. Now, the truth is, of course, forgiveness is not easy and it's not free, but the price is not paid by us. The price is paid by Jesus on the cross. And at the end of his life, as he says, it is finished. The thing that is finished is that the price is paid. The ransom is paid that we might be set free, paid in full once and for all. 
Do you remember the parable that Jesus told about um, the man who had crushing debts? And um, he went to the king and he said, Sire, please just give me more time. I I can't pay. And the king looked at him and took pity on him and took the piece of paper with the debts and tore it in half and threw it away and said, your debts are paid. That's it. You don't need anything else. And God has done that for each of us. Never take this for granted. Is this your story? Is this your song? Another detail perhaps worth mentioning. Forgiveness doesn't mean that there are no consequences to our actions or our failings. So to take King David as uh, an example, though he discovered the forgiveness and mercy of God, though he knew he was forgiven, he still lived with the consequences of his sins. But there is real forgiveness, and forgiveness means that there can be relationship again instead of separation and division. There can be new beginnings instead of old regrets. There can be new life and growth instead of decay. And the consequence of being forgiven should be transformative. It should change who we are. That if this is our story, if this is our song, we are changed by the experience of being forgiven. We often think that um, we can only have a relationship with God if we are good, if we do what's right. But perhaps the most important thing that we have to say is that actually it's not, that's not, that's upside down, it's the other way around. That good behavior comes out of a relationship with God. That as we discover that we are loved, as we are brought into a relationship with God. So that's the thing that shapes our lives. Right living comes from a right relationship, not the other way around. One last thing to say, and I say this in all humility, but um, David's advice from his hard-earned experience is verse 9. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding. Can you hear what he's saying? I mean, he's actually saying about himself that he was basically like the stubborn donkey who went his own way and wouldn't be turned around. But he's also saying we can all be like that. And we can, can't we? Don't be like the stubborn donkey. Humility means the ability to turn and to say sorry and to restore the relationship and to find forgiveness. And it isn't always easy. But the truth, I suspect, is that too often, most of our problems come from that stubbornness, from that insistence on going our own way, on doing what we want, and not being willing to be told what to do. Someone once said, you should keep short accounts with God. I'm not a very good accountant, so I'm not entirely sure what that means. But I think I get the idea. It means to go back often. It means to not be stubborn and and do that thing where when we're making a mess of things to keep making a mess of things just because we don't want to say that we're sorry. No, no, no. Turn around. Say sorry. Find the restoration and the change that comes as a result of it. By acknowledging how we are responsible, how we've fallen short, we step back into the relationship with God which gives life, which helps us to be the people that we are supposed to be. Verse 6 says, therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. And it's in that prayer, in that relationship with God and with the people of God that we find the freedom, the grace, and um, the, 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 the strength to, to live in relationship with God. And the job of the church is not to condemn, but to say to others, come and find the same freedom and mercy that we have found. Here it is. It's free. It is the greatest of gifts. Here you find love and acceptance. We say, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So, brothers and sisters, we sing these songs of deliverance. This is our story. This is the story that we tell, a story of mercy and forgiveness and reconciliation. This is the heart of our faith. And in a world full of darkness, this gospel of truth and reconciliation is still the greatest force to change people's lives. 
This is our story. This is our song. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Amen.